Synopsis of the Books of the Bible. Romans. By J. N. Darby. New Testament. Romans. Chapters 15 verse 8 to 16 verse 27. Paul's thought of God's dealings with Jew and Gentile in the advent of Jesus. These instructions close the epistle. From Romans 15 to 8, it is the exordium, the personal circumstances of the apostle, and salutations. In verses 8 to 12, he sums up his thoughts respecting God's dealings with the Jew and the Gentile in the advent of Jesus. He was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to accomplish the promises made to the fathers. For to the Jews God had made promises, but none to the Gentiles. To the latter it was not truth that was in question, but by grace, they might through Jesus glorify God for his mercy. For them, the apostle quotes passages from Deuteronomy, that is to say, from the law, from the Psalms, and from the prophets. Paul's desires for the Roman Christians and his present service for Jews. In verse 13, he turns affectionately to the Romans to express his desires for them, and his confidence in the blessing they had received from God, which enabled them mutually to exhort one another, while expressing at the same time his boldness in some sort, because of the grace God had given him, to be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles by fulfilling a public function with regard to them, being, as it were, a priest to offer up the Gentiles as an offering acceptable to God, because sanctified by the Holy Ghost, see Numbers 8 verse 11. This was his glory before God. This sanctification by the Holy Ghost was that which took the place of sanctification by birth, and it was well worth it. Moreover, he had accomplished his task from Jerusalem round about to Illyricum, not where Christ had been preached before, but where they had not yet heard of him. This had prevented his coming to Rome. But now that there was no more place for him, according to the Holy Ghost, nothing more in those parts for him to do, and having long desired to see them, he thought to visit them on his way to Spain. For the moment he was going to Jerusalem with the collection made in Macedonia and the Achaia for the saints. We see that his heart turns to the Jews, they occupied his thoughts, and while desiring to put the seal of performance on the grace which this collection betokened, he was preoccupied with them as Jews, as those who had a claim, a mingled feeling perhaps of one who was anxious to show that he did not forget them, for, in fact, he loved his nation. We have to learn whether, in executing this service, properly that of a deacon, pleasing as it might be, he was at the height of his mission as apostle. However that might be, the hand of God was in it to make all things work for the good of his beloved servant and child, as well as for his own glory. Paul had a presentiment that it would not perhaps turn out well, and he asks the prayers of the saints at Rome, that he might be delivered from the hands of the wicked, and see their face with joy. We know how it ended, the subject was spoken of when we were considering the Acts. He saw them indeed at Rome, he was delivered, but as a prisoner, and we do not know if he ever went to Spain the ways of God are according to his eternal counsels, and according to his grace, and according to his perfect wisdom. Personal salutations and loving remembrance of service for the Lord. Never having known the Roman Christians as an assembly, Paul sends many personal salutations. This was the link which subsisted. We see how touchingly his heart dwells upon all the details of service which attached him to those who had rendered it. He who by grace had searched into all the counsels of God, who had been admitted to see that which could not be made known to man here below, remembered all that these humble Christians, these devoted women, had done for him and for the Lord. This is love, it is the real proof of the power of the Spirit of God, it is the bond of charity. A precious and perfect rule for the Christian walk. We have also here a precious and most perfect rule for our walk, namely, to be simple concerning evil, and wise unto that which is good. Christianity alone could have given such a rule, for it provides a walk that is positively good, and wisdom to walk in it. As Christians, we may be simple concerning evil. What a deliverance! While the man of the world must needs acquaint himself with evil, in order to avoid it in this world of snares and of artifice, he must corrupt his mind, accustom himself to think of evil, in order not to be entrapped by it. But soon there should be entire deliverance, soon should Satan be trodden under their feet. The Apostles' Letters, The Prophetic Writings 
we see also that the apostle did not write his letters himself, but employed a brother to do it. Here it was one named Tertius, verse 22. Deeply concerned at the condition of the Galatians, he wrote himself the letter addressed to them, but the salutation at the end of this, as of other epistles, was in his own hand in order to verify the contents of the epistle. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 21, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 17, in which the feigned epistle alluded to in 2 Thessalonians 2 gave occasion to state this proof, which he always gave, that an epistle was truly his, we see likewise, by this little circumstance, that he attached a solemn and authoritative character to his epistles, that they were not merely the effusions of a spiritual heart, but that in writing them he knew and would have others understand, that they were worthy of consideration and of being preserved as authorities, as the expression and exercise of his apostolic mission, and were to be received as such, that is to say, as possessing the Lord's authority, with which he was furnished by the power of the Holy Ghost. They were letters from the Lord by his means, even as his words had also been, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, and 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37. The doxology of the last verse is suggesting truths linking this epistle with Paul's writings in general. We have yet to observe, with regard to the three verses at the end of the epistle, that they are, as it were, detached from all the rest, introducing, in the form of a doxology, the suggestion of a truth, the communication of which distinguished the apostle's teaching. He does not develop it here. The task which the Holy Ghost accomplished in this epistle, was the presentation of the soul individually before God according to the divine thoughts. Nevertheless, this connects itself immediately with the position of the body, and the doctrine respecting the body, the assembly, cannot be separated from it. Now the apostle informs us distinctly, that the mystery, the assembly, and the gathering together in one of all things under Christ, had been entirely unknown. God had been silent on that subject in the times which were defined by the word ages, the assembly not forming a part of that course of events, and of the ways of God on earth. But the mystery was now revealed and communicated to the Gentiles by prophetic writings, not the writings of the prophets. The epistles addressed to the Gentiles possessed this character, they were prophetic writings, a fresh proof of the character of the epistles in the New Testament. The Significance of the Postscript the scope of the epistle. He who has understood the doctrine of this epistle, and of the writings of Paul in general, will readily apprehend the significance of this postscript. The epistle itself develops with divine perfection and fullness how a soul can stand before God in this world, and the grace and righteousness of God, maintaining with all his counsels as to Israel, 